so my skeptical mind, and that's just that's just who I am. My skeptical mind goes to, well, yeah, of course you've got this guy over here that's logical and reasonable, and you got this guy over here that's wearing a tinfoil hat. Of course the tinfoil hat guy's gonna see a lot of stuff, right? He's, he's like imagining it, or he's watched one too many uh, sci-fi movies. But it's used to help us frame hypotheses for UFO uh, propulsion, power, stealth, uh, weaponry. Everything that we experience is very positive. Sometimes the field of ufology has a short memory span. All right. Good evening. It must be my favorite night of the week because it's Friday, and that means I get to hang out with the coolest people on the planet. Every week we are talking to guests that can help enrich the topic, share information, and help us move in a direction where we aren't being taken advantage of, we're not being fed a bunch of of nonsense, and we're really making good strides to preserve the history. I am really, really excited tonight to have Chris Rutowski on on the show because he hasn't been on for years. And I always, I follow him and, and see what he's up to, and I always enjoy his very thoughtful comments on the subject. He has been researching this since the 19 well he's, he's, since the 1970s that can't even be right is that really right chris yes it is <laughs> wow. i'm that old no. <laughs> yeah of course, of course back 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 then i was you know we were having to uh to discuss things with passenger pigeons and chisel them onto rocks and stuff like that so it was, it was tougher but <laughs> okay, that is so awesome. Thank you. That just makes me laugh. But you, I mean, I thank you for being here. This is going to be a really, really fun and much needed show. But you are, you're a Canadian science writer, educator. You have a degree in astronomy and education. And you've been collecting reports from all sorts of indifferent, not just UFOs, but lake monsters and Sasquatch. And you've published several books on the topic, including A Natural History, Abductions and Aliens, A World of UFOs. The children's book I saw it too, the big book of UFOs, and you have um, you have also have a couple other books, but you've got a new book out now, and you've been on all of these great TV shows. In fact, it seems like I'm seeing you more on TV uh, now than I have in a long time, and that's awesome. Uh, it could be, yeah. It did actually ramp up over the past uh, six months or so. In fact, I was interviewed just last week for something from Discovery, and uh, uh, there's more to come. So yeah, it's it's happening. That is is so great, and it's it's good to see. Like when you turn on some of the TV shows, you you know you see, I think typically the same five people, you know, and so it's always refreshing to see somebody with your knowledge base and dedication to the subject. and And I think you've got such a fun sense of humor too. I think that really makes for a nice, uh, you know, profile on TV, and so that's cool. I well, well thank you so much. That's very nice of you to say. Yeah, very no, nice. Absolutely. Of you to say. And so I so I want to talk a little bit because I know that you have donated your archive to the University of Manitoba. And if people who listen well, people that listen to my show know how much I've of time and effort I put into what I've done. I can't imagine your archive and how spectacular it is, but will you just tell us a little bit more about that and then how you went about approaching the university and, and all of that good stuff? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, they approached me. Um, I uh, uh, have been uh, involved with a number of institutions for years, and uh, they got to know me over the years because I've been doing research in the university's archives at a number of institutions. And um, I'm trying to think now, when was this? I guess 2018, 20, yeah, I guess 2018, something like that, 2017. I was approached by the head archivist uh, at the university who said, you know, you, you must have a lot of uh, files and documents and we're always getting questions about uh, these types of things. And it coincided with uh, the uh, 50th anniversary of a famous case up here in Canada, the Falcon Lake case. And I had been trying to decide what to do with these files because there were uh, literally three or 400 pages of documents from the government that uh, we've been able to, uh, to locate. Uh, in addition, there are my own research files, plus photographs, uh, not only the photographs from the family of the, the witness, but photographs from Life magazine, photographs taken by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, 
uh, just a whole series of stuff, all in this one particular case. And uh, the archivist said, well, you know, have you, what, have you thought about what you're going to do with it uh, eventually? And I, I said, well, no. And uh, she said, well, would you consider donating them to the university? And I said, well, yeah, not a bad idea. And um, we began negotiating. And I pointed out that in addition to, I mean, this was just one particular case. I said, I have literally tens of thousands of other reports uh, on record. Uh, plus all my books uh, to support the research, plus all the zines, uh, correspondence, I mean, all that sort of stuff. And then they said, yeah, donate all of that too. So I said, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, they, they said one stipulation is that, you know, we really, you know, there's so much uh, material and there's such a high demand. If we started uh, just hanging on to it, it wouldn't be doing as much good as if we were able to scan it in and, uh, you know, universities were uh, cutting their budgets for whatever reasons, for, for uh, economics and, and cutbacks and whatever. And uh, they said, well, is there a way that we can maybe crowdfund uh, uh, a way to preserve uh, the material and digitize it? And uh, we got our heads together and we produced a, uh, a, a crowdfunding uh, system or program and a project so that people could donate to help scan in um, a lot of this material. And uh, it's almost at the end of its run. Uh, I think we, we gave it uh, a year, year and a half or something like that. And I think it's only up for another few days officially, but you know, it's still going to be open, I think. Um, the goal was 25,000 and the last time I checked it was over 28,000. Uh, so people have been very generous in supporting this, and I want to thank each and every one of them who, who've done so. Uh, and the, the idea is that this will be scanned in, and there's a sort of a, uh, a, a precedent to this because the uh, Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa, which is the Canadian equivalent of, I guess, the Smithsonian, um, they have had the repository for the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's UFO reports uh, dating back to the 1940s um, and what they've done is they've scanned in uh, almost uh, 10,000 separate documents from these files and made them available digitally so uh, this was sort of a, uh, our, our local version of that and of course since then there have been a number of other uh, Canadian um, uh, our, uh, sources and, and uh, collections that have been preserved. Uh, uh, there's one called the Arthur Bray Collection in Ottawa, but mo more people are more familiar with Stanton Friedman. Uh, after he passed, uh, his family donated uh, all of his records to the province of New Brunswick uh, uh, archives, and uh, they are actually going to be holding a, a, a sort of a, a Presentation, and I don't know how they're going to do it with it with the lockdowns, but they're going to be holding a a uh, an online uh, presentation of uh, of these uh, documents from Stan Friedman's files, and I think that's going to be in July. Uh, I'm one of the ones who's asked to uh, give a presentation as part of this. Uh, Kathleen Martin, who's a close friend of Stan's, is going to be present giving a presentation. A few other people. And uh, it's it's going to be quite interesting, and that's that's from a government. That's the government of New Brunswick that is actually doing this. They're honoring Stan Friedman's UFO legacy. So first of all, just can you imagine a state doing that in the United States to honor no. uh, the legacy of a UFO researcher? No. <laughs> um, and then he, and here in Manitoba, uh, a different province, uh, a, a, an academic institution is interested in preserving uh, the you know my work. Uh, as part of a sort of a, a historical record of what people, uh, not just in Manitoba, but all across Canada have seen. So it's, uh, it, it's quite interesting that there is an, a significant interest in, in you know, real information. Like, this is not speculation. These are documents. Uh, these are, are uh, uh, files on what people and, and reports of what people have seen and the correspondence that Stan has had, I've had. So th these are actual tangible things and uh, it's it's quite interesting that uh, there's more academic and scholarly interest in UFOs uh, these days than there has been. Having said that, of course, there's been something like 25 or 50 uh, doctor, doctoral or master's thesis on uh, UFOs that have been published every year. 
uh, for the past 20 or 30 years, if not longer. So, I mean, there always has been a, a scholarly and academic interest in UFOs, and this is just the uh, the, the current phase or, or, you know, wave that we're going through. That, you know, that is so impressive. I mean, you, you talked about that, and I, I literally had chills because it's, I know how important this is. You know, when I have, I was telling you before we started the show, when I have, you know, people like Barry Greenwood and, and Jan Aldrich and, and people here in the United States who I've you know, spent a lot of time talking with and and picking their brain and to know how hard it's been, you know, on on many fronts. I mean, raising funds on on storing these things, making sure they're they're preserved and and it is it is a, a fight. And so for you to have this wonderful uh, network of people that, you know, you have really fostered and you're creating this cool thing and you're working with the government. I mean, that that is fantastic yeah and i have to you know shout out to jan aldrich and mary greenwood you know for for doing such amazing work and uh and for you for for taking uh, those files and, and documents uh from them and preserving them uh yourself i mean uh you know a lot of this material would be lost uh if it wasn't for this i mean one can only think of ted phillips uh um uh physical trace files uh which um for the bulk are, are actually lost um, and he just passed away, I think, just about last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, a lot of his legacy is gone, but I know people are trying to recreate some of it and locate some of it. So, you know, there are, there are files. Uh, Hynek files are around. I know that uh, uh, the APRO files are still in the wind somewhere, but I think some of them have been, been located. So, you know, they're, tracking down a lot of this information is, is very valuable, and some people have done a tremendous job at, uh, at doing that. And so what, what is the latest that you've heard with the APRO files then? Because that was, I mean, that's been, how long have, have people been <laughs> trying to get their hands on, on the, those? Yeah, yeah. the last I heard is that they were um, uh, bought by a, a, a private group that was supposed to be a, a UFO group but never materialized, I guess, uh, and that they were in Chicago. And I, I again, I, I'm not sure, I, I didn't follow it as closely, I I heard that that somehow QFOS might have been able to locate some of them, but I, I might be mistaken. I, I'm I'm not sure what happened to the bulk of the Afro files. Oh, that's interesting. That would be. I know that you know. It, it, uh, from what I understand, Jacques Vallée had been to uh, the couple that had the files to to their home mm-hmm. um, on several occasions and things. And so it is interesting. It's this kind of a behind the scenes mystery. <laughs> Where where are the files and who's getting their hands on them and how how is um, this information potentially going to be shared or not shared? And I know that you have have you know expressed you know feelings over the years about the way we should be able able to access things. And, and again, another big point for you because you are digitizing these things and they're going to be available. And I, that's just, again, you're, I mean, props to that. That's so cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, for example, one chunk of that, uh, somewhere around 22,000 cases uh, just from the past was it 32 years? Uh, I started doing the Canadian UFO survey formally in 1989, and these 22,000 cases come from just that period. Now, of course, I have cases from before that, um, and there's a few other subsets, but there's 22,000 separate reports in that file. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, those theoretically could be uh, digitized or they're going to be preserved in archives for people to go through. Uh, I mean, uh, back in the early 90s, we really didn't have a good handle on what we were trying to do. In fact, we were just you know, trying to sort out you know, how many cases there were in a year and, and uh, you know, what geographical locations they were from and how many were red and how many were green and that, that type of thing. So we were just, you know, starting out to try and document this. Um, and, you know, maybe somebody can go back and find additional information uh, in the files themselves uh, to add to, uh, to records and uh, make the database even more robust. So there's all sorts of things that can be done uh, with these files. And, it, uh, uh, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg, really, because, you know, between what we have and, and uh, 
other researchers have P Peter Davenport's uh, collection, uh, MUFON, uh, what's preserved by uh, uh, in uh, in Scandinavia. You know, there's there's some some really good databases out there, and it's just a matter of, of you know amassing this this huge body of data. And and, and I think that. You know, for, for people that are are tuning into my show tonight, and sometimes we all get caught up in the the current news or the circus sideshow acts that we <laughs> we have going on, and we we don't tend to look at some of these wonderful repositories of information. And if you just go, you know, you go to visit AFU or you visit, you know, some of these other other places, you can read about cases that nobody's probably ever even paid attention to that are really, really cool. And that to me would be worth so much more time than getting into some of the things that are, are, are taking place now that might not, you know, <laughs> pan out in, in the future. Well, sure. And I guess the point is that um, the UFO reports themselves dating back years uh, are really the foundation upon which all of ufology rests. I mean, all the speculation about propulsion and what star they're from and whether we're talking about reptilians or blue avians or, or whatever, um, it, it actually boils down to what people have actually said that they have seen and experienced. And these are the records. So, uh, you know, you can push all the other stuff away and say, this is what, you know, we're, we're really looking at. This is the hard data. And all the other stuff is speculation. Um, and, you know, as far as government documents go, uh, you know, we have the things from, from the, you know, the Nimitz and, and uh, uh, the, the, the Pentagon videos. And we actually don't have uh, reports on those necessarily. We have some documentation. But, uh, I mean, uh, as was stated in the 60 Minutes thing just last week, you know, UFOs were seen for two years every night. Well, where are the reports on those? There must be documentation of those somewhere. Um, we do know that uh, since Blue Book finished in 1969 and a little bit into 1970, uh, it's, the United States has been kind of a black hole in terms of uh, what has been investigated, what has been experienced by military personnel, what's been reported to the Pentagon. We really don't know much. Uh, people like Paul Dean and, and a few others have dug out some interesting cases after 1970 up until uh, relatively recently into the 70s and 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, the reports continue to come and a few other people are, are digging into some case files and finding, you know, scattered things here and there in Canada. Uh, you know, it's been a little more transparent. Um, the, uh, the National Research Council of Canada, again, which was kind of like the Smithsonian, I suppose, uh, for lack of anything better comparison, um, uh, investigated UFOs from about 1965 uh, until 1995. And all of those files are available. The, the cases, the reports are actually investigated by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We found those cases. Those cases uh, have been examined. Uh, as a matter of fact, my next book goes into uh, uh, you know, more detail on, on that type of thing. Um, and, uh, but, and even after 1995, um, there has still been a constant trickle, uh, not necessarily a flood, but uh, at least a very uh, trickle of UFO reports from military personnel, from pilots that we continually get. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, information on these. I mean, in fact, the most recent uh, of these cases was, uh, let's see here, May the 9th at about four o'clock in the morning. Um, over northern Saskatchewan, um, a Delta Airlines uh, flight from Fairbanks to Minneapolis was cruising at 39,000 feet when the pilot inquired as to the identity of traffic well above them and moving right to left. The controller advised that there is no known traffic in the area. The pilot replied that they couldn't figure out what it was either. And we actually have this record that uh, an American... Delta Airlines pilot uh, on an American run uh, had a UFO experience over Canada, and the experience is recorded in uh, the Transport Canada uh, files, which we happen to get. So this is something that's happening now. I mean, 
uh, it's not something that has happened in records and you have to dig them out and you're waiting for a congressional investigation or a Senate Intelligence Committee to give us these records. This is what's happening now. And we have documentation that UFOs are being seen by experienced witnesses. One would hope that a Delta Airlines pilot was experienced, uh, no matter what you think of Delta. And, um, the, um, but, you know, somebody with, you know, I don't know, 10,000 hours of, of flying time will have seen something and reported it to air traffic control. What do you do with those cases? Um, and it's just a matter of put, piecing together this data and uh, seeing what we got. And so I have to ask you, like, how do we, you know, when you've got, there's so many things flying around now. And I mean, obviously, we're developing technologies and and I'm sure there's a lot going on that, that could be explained by man-made technology. And so how do you, when you've got a pilot that is observing something, I mean, of course, you know, we always say that, and they do, they, they are trained observers, but does that, are they, be, are they trained in how to identify specific, you know, drones or some of the other things that would be in the skies now? Oh, yeah. There's no question. Just because a UFO is reported, it doesn't automatically mean that it's alien or completely unidentified. That's a very good point. In fact, pilots are prone to making mistakes just like anyone else. One would hope, though, that um, pilots with, you know, 250 or 300 people on board isn't uh, going to be making a, a mistake in identifying something that's flying past his plane, endangering the, possibly endangering the life of of passengers. In fact, we did have a uh, a case here in Canada in, well, I'm trying to remember what year now. This goes back maybe three years, 2018, 2019, 2018, I think, uh, where an airline um, was flying, I think, between Ottawa and Toronto. Um, and uh, they encountered a uh, an object shaped like um, a, an inner tube, except it was upright. And it was directly in their path. They had to take evasive maneuvers uh, to avoid it. And in doing so, uh, the stewards uh, uh, on board uh, weren't buckled in, of course, uh, and they uh, were thrown against the bulkhead and had to be treated um, by medical personnel. Uh, so there are injuries caused by UFOs. <laughs> um, and uh, the case was investigated, and uh, drones and balloons were ruled out, apparently, by the, uh, the Canadian um, uh, Transport Canada, which was the equivalent of the FAA. Um, but they you know, were not sure exactly what this thing was. So, you know, there are enough of these cases, and in Canada we've got somewhere around 1,000 UFO reports every year, and of those, maybe, I don't know, 20... 25, 30, um, might be from pilots uh, uh, encountering things that they're, they're seeing while on in flight. And I would argue that, okay, let's say these things are drones or balloons or, or you know, maybe there's a, uh, something that's being detected on radar that's malfunctioning, perhaps, because it's saying there's something there when there really isn't. And that we have lots of cases of those. If that's the case... I would argue that this poses a security and safety risk uh, to the population. Um, and, you know, that alone, to me, demands that the UFO phenomenon be studied in greater detail because uh, it involves uh, the lives of people. So forget about trying to figure out if, uh, you know, UFOs are, are alien spaceships that are um, transmedium or, or whatever they are. Uh, they pose a security risk, a safety risk, mm -hmm. and uh, they're a scientific uh, mystery that has to be looked into a little bit more. So uh, it, it's time to, to take these things a little more seriously. And I absolutely agree with you. And, and, and I have to ask you, when you look at some of the, the things that are taking place here in the United States, I mean, we're seeing... Yeah, we have, obviously there's a lot of a lot of activity going on here. I mean, do you worry? I mean, do you what what first of all, what is your take on that? And do you worry that somehow this could be turned into a um the subject could be 
discredited if certain people involved are promoting, you know, the MJ-12 uh, kind of nonsense and, and all of that that we've seen through the decades that definitely leaves a black eye on, on the subject. Well, yeah, there's a, a couple of ways of looking at this. Um, I know a lot of people are, are saying that, you know, the, the outstanding media attention um, is is really quite remarkable. Um, and, and I say, yeah, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Certainly this is the first time 60 Minutes has, has, has looked at UFOs. Um, but, you know, there have been other TV specials. Peter Jennings was, what, uh, 2004, 5, 6? I don't know, something like that, a, a major study uh, on, uh, on network news. Uh, the New York Times, uh, people are saying the New York Times wrote an article, uh, you know, the Leslie Keene articles about UFOs. Well, the New York Times, if you actually just do a, a periodical search of the New York Times and the search word UFO, and it comes out with dozens and dozens and dozens of stories. I mean, New York Times did a major feature on Pascagoula. New York Times did major features on, on many UFO cases over the years. Um, and uh, even when Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out, uh, you know, Alan Hynek was interviewed um, very much by pretty well every uh, network. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, stories were uh, not all giggly. Uh, there was some serious wanting to know exactly what's going on. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of media interest over the years. I mean, during the X-Files years, uh, UFO interest was at a peak as well. So this is interesting. The difference is, right now is that you know, it's combined with a few things. It's combined with the Navy and the Pentagon videos which are being played everywhere and there's a lot of interest. Um, uh, and even um, uh, uh, President Obama, Barack Obama, uh, you know, was on a Corden's show uh, recently and, okay, it's a comedy show and he's asked very flippantly about UFOs and he answers flippantly, and then he says, well, let's get serious, though. You I mean, there's things out there that I, I think can't be identified. That alone uh, drew enough attention that it spawned further media interest. So there's a lot at play here. Um, so the media interest by itself isn't new, but the, the combination of all these factors is really uh, driving this uh, almost to a frenzy. And... Uh, I mean, my concern right now is that the Senate Intelligence Committee report is technically due next month. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was delayed for whatever reason. These things always happen. Um, and um, there's nothing saying that there's going to be uh, everything uh, unclassified in it. It's certainly possible there's going to be some sections that are going to be redacted. Um, because of uh, sightings that occurred on um, missions that were classified, perhaps, by military personnel uh, that won't be released to the, to the public. Uh, so it, it may not be exactly what people are looking for. And, you know, we're just not that far away, really, from the Condon Report, which everybody was looking forward to. And when it came out, everybody sort of uh, either the skeptics uh, embraced it as saying, I told you so, there's nothing to UFOs. And the, uh, the people who actually read it <laughs> um, and uh, understood uh, how to read between the lines saw that there was a, a lot of information in there that, uh, that needed further examination. So I, I think the, the report that might come out next month is kind of going to be kind of a Rorschach test for ufologists, people who will see in it what they want to see, uh, because it's not going to be as definitive uh, as people are, are hoping. That, that's my, my feeling anyways. No, that, that and that is, you, you, yeah, that is the. I love the way you you put that. I mean, people will see in it what they want to see, which is clearly the case with the UFO subject. I mean, people are trying to pick pick things out. And I mean, I, I I get it. And this is a it is an interesting time. And thank you for pointing out that this isn't the first time when you've seen a huge interest with the media and and close encounters was you know close encounters x files i mean these were the these were the movies and tv shows that really um inspired people and it also put things out to the public that potentially could maybe uh steer people's ideas and and beliefs 
And I know that in my Aunt Ruffel archives, I've got a really interesting exchange between Dr. Richard Haynes and Anne and, and some of the people in the, the NICAP subcommittee. And they were, they were concerned about the release of Close Encounters because of the potential of, of what it, it would do to the, the public and their perceptions of things. And I thought that was very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's been some very interesting uh, studies of media and UFOs. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I think on my bookcase I still have uh, Herbert Strentz's, uh thesis on uh, on UFOs. Do I still have that? Oh, I think I do. I'm going to go off for a second here. Where's Strentz? I actually have my copy of Strentz right here. A survey of press coverage of unidentified flying objects, 1947 to 1966. And it was a doctoral thesis from Northwestern University in 1970 uh, by Herbert Strentz. And I actually have a copy of the thesis in my library uh, that hasn't been transferred over to uh, the university yet. Um, wow. And, you know, so that's a, con a, a connection and a, an investigation into media relationships with, uh, with UFOs um, that, you know, dates back quite a few years now. So... I'm sure that we're going to see analyses of what's happening now as well. Um, and I guess people are getting, you know, all sorts of information. I, I know that John Greenwald has been parsing the uh, what the Pentagon is saying and what we're hearing from uh, uh, from ATIP and, and uh, Elizondo and wherever. And I find it very interesting that the day after 60 Minutes was aired, um, the Pentagon kind of walked back one comment that uh, Ed Bradley had said that, um, you know, the, the videos are unexplained. And the Pentagon said, no, we actually didn't say they were unexplained. We said they're part of the uh, videos that are uh, in the uh, UAP task force that were, were being examined, which is quite different. Wow. And uh, that's so, I mean... Uh, but did did the fact that they walked that back get any, get any media attention? No. no, because the the narrative is that these are unexplained videos. Now I have to say, I mean I I don't know what what these videos represent. I mean I've seen Mick West's analysis, which uh, pretty well every hardcore UFO zealot uh, rejects completely. But by golly, he makes some really interesting points, mm -hmm. um, and and by themselves. Uh, I know as much as people want to, you know, say that these things are capable of of Mach 17 and and uh, uh, you know 300 Gs or I don't know, you know, some ridiculous numbers and all this sort of stuff, you can't really say that these things in the videos are doing that. What you can say is that they appear to be doing that, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, you won't be able to say for sure until you have one of these things in your garage and you're tinkering with it and you're taking it apart bolt by bolt. Um, until that comes, uh, you, they, they seem to be doing that. Now, you combine that, however, with what the pilots have been seeing, and it was very interesting to see Alex Dietrich come forward and support Fravor's testimony, um, that yet you had four people in jet aircrafts watching these things fly circles around them. Um, you know, that I think is much more important than the videos themselves. Uh, and I don't know what to make of the, uh, of the, uh, the pilot testimony, but I just read to you pilot testimony from, uh, last week of another pilot who had seen something in the sky. So the fact that Fravor and Dietrich saw something, you know, 15 years ago, well, you know, it happens all the time and I'm, uh, you know, I, 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 I accept the fact that it's interesting that we're getting these from Navy personnel, but pilot reports are very, very common. And, uh, you know, if that's not enough to uh, pique people's interest, I don't know what is. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like when you kind of move away from some of the current news and then really dig into other reports and things, I think that's where you know, you can find some really good stuff because it, for me personally, looking at some of the things that are going on, I mean, there's a, you know, a, a group of people who are all connected by 
you know, Robert Bigelow by, uh, you know, I mean, they, they have these connections. They're working with To The Stars Academy. There's a, a vested interest, and I don't think that, that uh, Alex uh, Dietrich, I mean, I, don't, I think she is, I really enjoyed hearing what she had to say that was really, I'm sure that must have been um, it, probably a, a difficult thing. You know, it is for any pilot coming forward, a professional uh, to come forward with things like that. But I do think there is, we sh- it, for me, I, I feel the need to be cautious because of specific connections and because of the the fact that some of these people have not necessarily put forth what they have have promised to do and have almost, in a way, added more confusion to the topic. Yeah, and I, I think I just saw, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Erica, just today, this is another Greenwald special, that, or maybe it wasn't Greenwald, maybe it was somebody else, but somebody found correspondence uh, between Luis Elizondo and Alex Dietrich a month before he left his position uh, in, in intelligence uh, to create the, the TTSA. So he was, he had heard her story um, and, and then, uh, you know, whether that was it <laughs> that spurred him to, to strike out on his own, that was the last straw, I don't know, but it's, it, it's interesting that, that, that connection, we hadn't heard from her before, mm-hmm. but Elizondo knew perfectly well who, who she was years and years and years ago. That is interesting. And I think, you know, this, uh, there, there will be more things I'm sure that, that come out in, in time. Does it, do you think because of, you know, Elizondo has been asked to kind of verify his credentials and his place and, you know, role in, in specific operations. And, and from what I'm understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong because it's been a long week, but the the only real, you know, verification that we have is the letter that Harry Reid put out. Am I, am I correct in that? Um, I, I think that's the main one. I, 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 under the impression there's something else too, but uh, I mean, I think it's fairly well established that he was somehow involved in uh, in that office. I, I'm fairly satisfied that he was. Um, I know that uh, uh, you know a lot of people are digging into his into this uh, and his background uh, a lot more in, intensely than than I can. Um, so I'm willing to accept the possibility that that he actually uh, did what he said he did. Um, but what's curious to me is that these videos were were leaked, um, and in the case of at least one of them, they were, they were leaked on the internet by this German uh, chat group, <laughs> you know, years before. Um, you know, where did they come from? Who's leaking them? And I want to know more about these videos because two of them are parts of the same event that have been chopped in half. Uh, where's the rest of it? Uh, why aren't we getting uh, all the details? What's been taken out of them? Um, and you know, I understand uh, uh, Elizondo's you know reluctance, you know, citing uh, secrecy and uh, uh, issues that uh, you know he is embroiled in because of his intelligence background. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's it's a matter of. Um, who do you trust? Uh, you know, we might as well be on a TV show from the 1960s. Uh, uh, who, who do we believe here? Um, and, and I think you, you combine all of this with the fact that we have the videos, we have the pilot testimony, and the fact that the Pentagon is being driven completely crazy by numerous people filing, you know, detailed uh, FOIAs for you know, the tiniest phrase, and they've been tripped up a few times, uh, and, uh, you know, they're being very cagey, they're being, you know, really, really careful with the semantics. Um, so obviously, something went down that, <laughs> between Elizondo and his superiors in the, the Pentagon that, that I, I have no idea what, um, but it's it's an interesting mystery, and it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. Uh, uh, I mean, there's these wonderful, you know, people have suggested that it's all uh, for the cash, follow the money, that, you know, uh, uh, some congressmen had put forth these ideas, uh, made deals with certain businessmen without naming names, um, and that's where the the funding came from. 
I don't know. I mean, uh, that's that's what you have to do in a lot of cases is follow the money, and that certainly muddies the water too. And I think the problem is um, that, you know, if this has muddied the water, the mu- the water could be so full of silt that we'll never see through to the bottom. And uh, that's you know, probably what happened with Roswell, that we'll never get to the bottom of Roswell because it's been so tainted and, and so uh, embroiled with so much other stuff. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next uh, little while. No, I absolutely agree. I think it will be, you know, it, very, very interesting. And I think, you know, again, I, I just, to me, um, yeah, this is because of all of these different, you know, factors that you've mentioned. I think it's, it's you know, people should maybe just step back and kind of reserve judgment and not jump to, you know, yes, extraterrestrials are here and we've got, you know, I mean, all, all of this great stuff happening because we can we can get into trouble <laughs> doing that. We've done that over the years. You know, you know how we are. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And even things like um, one of the questions that, that I was still get is, uh, you know, with all the uh, interest in uh, – uh, in the videos and the Pentagon and every all the media interest, you know the numbers of UFOs are are increasing and it's just it's absolutely crazy the number of reports that we're getting. Well, I mean your listeners are going to get a scoop because um, no question, and uh, Cheryl Costa of course uh, found this too that during 2020 the number of UFO reports that uh, were rec- reported and recorded. Uh, did increase dramatically. Uh, uh, she found them in uh, in her records for states in the MUFON uh, files, and uh, in Canada we uh, looked at uh, not just MUFON, but MUFON and Davenport and all the reports that were filed officially and, and to uh, all the various UFO groups. Um, and the number of UFO reports in 2020 was, you know, orders uh, o- over the, the 2019 uh, uh, numbers. I'm thinking uh, that maybe we're looking at 40 percent uh, more cases uh, than 2019, uh, and in some cases more than that. Uh, so yeah, the numbers of UFO reports increased dramatically over 2019 in 2020, but the number of UFO reports recorded so far in 2021, and we've already gone through the first quarter, so we can actually have this data, is way down. In fact, um, uh, in fact, I think I yeah I do actually have this number right here. So for New Fork, uh, Peter Davenport's group, uh, the number of UFO reports uh, in 2020 for the first quarter was uh, 2,066. For 2021, for the first quarter. 771. That's a decrease of 63%. Whoa. For MUFON, same period, same comparison, uh, down 24%. Um, and so the numbers of UFO reports in 2021 are, are way down compared to 2020. Now, the explanations that people had posited... Uh, for the increase in 2020 over 2019 was the pandemic, maybe, that, uh, you know, people were spending less time inside venues um, and out in their own backyards or in fields or, or I don't know, but they weren't inside <laughs> without a view of the sky. Uh, they were uh, somewhere uh, else, and that may have, you know, increased the number of UFO reports. Well, the pandemic's still on, and the number of UFO reports has plummeted. So what is that attributed to? I'm not sure. And it's not related to media, obviously, because uh, the media frenzy, if anything, is getting greater. So uh, what exactly is going on? I don't know. But, uh, you know, when you hear and see posts, and we, I continually see these posts about the number of UFOs increasing. Uh, it's simply not true. If you look at the actual data, and I have to say, this is why we study the data. We, we wanted to know exactly what's going on. And uh, this is the importance of actually keep going through the UFO reports themselves. 
And that, that is fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. That is, I mean, there's so many interesting angles to, to all of this, but yeah, studying the data is important. And so, I mean, what, what types of, um, objects are being seen now and being reported? Um, well, there's no question that the, the same types of objects as have always been seen, mostly lights in the sky. Uh, one thing that drove a lot of reports in 2020 uh, was Starlink, Elon Musk's, uh, you know, constant barrage of uh, new satellites into the sky. Um, and we, even just this past month, we've got people reporting and taking photographs of these, you know, beautiful strings of pearls moving through the sky that turn out to be the Starlink constellations as they're uh, rising. We actually had some very, very puzzling photos and videos that were reported um, right across Canada and also in the United States. Uh, I had some reported from uh, Minneapolis. Um, of You see, now here's the thing. If you've seen Starlink satellites, you know what they, what they look like. They're these um, uh, small points of light in a long line. Um, we've heard uh, people seeing 20 or 30 at a time. Of course, there's like 60 at a time that are sent up. Uh, and they eventually spread out. But usually we'll get people saying that they saw 20 or 30 at a time, sometimes just 10. Uh, they're moving across the sky uh, together. And that freaks people out because it seems rather unusual. Um, but what we were getting were photos and videos and reports of much smaller chunks of light. Um, cigars, uh, cigar-shaped objects basically just... Um, the width of a moon or something like that uh, at arm's length um, moving through the sky um, and you know we were trying to figure out what the heck were these things and the fact that they were seen literally from coast to coast and north to south uh, suggested to us that it was something you know astronomical or, or uh, uh, aerospace involved and a lot of these coincided uh, with the launches of Starlink. In fact, some of these uh, coincided with to the minute uh, with one another. And as far as we can figure out is that when the satellites are first released, like they're released from a, from a small cigar-shaped fuselage, um, and uh, uh, then they sort of fan out uh, slowly from there in two parallel uh, tracks or clumps. And they're fairly small uh, when they're together. And we think that what people were seeing were the very, very early stages of Starlink uh, being released before they started spreading out on these individual dots moving in the sky. And, and it's just that they didn't look like a series of dots all clumped together. They looked like one long cigar-shaped light. Um, which is really strange, and I, I actually went to the trouble of contacting uh, some of the uh, uh, the debunkers uh, for help in this because uh, you know the the people who keep track of the satellites and insist that what people are seeing are satellite and rocket reentries, and by the way, they're right a lot of the mm -hmm. time. Um, I said, you know, is this possible that the, this is what we're looking at? And uh, I've seen since then some animations of what happens when Starlink is released, and it does look a lot like this. So uh, it's another um, IFO that we have to take into consideration when we're getting cases reported from people all over the place. So we're, we're continually getting some interesting reports, and uh, sometimes it's quite a challenge to try and unravel what people are seeing. Well, thank you that, for that, and I think that really is, is important for people to hear. I mean, there are there's there's so many things that are explainable when you just keep digging and that's so important because when you have something when you're ruling out all the possibilities and then you do have this you know brilliant exception that makes it all the more exciting you know so it's it's i, I don't yeah, know it's, it's, thank it's, you it's detective yeah it's detective work there's no question that it that we're more like Sherlock Holmes than anything else. Absolutely. And I have a couple questions uh, for you, and I'll ask you one before we get a chat, and then, or one before we get a break, and then one after. But the question is uh, from Peter William Shelley, who was on my show last week, but he wants to know of an interesting example of a Canadian abduction case. Oh, okay. Um, 
You can answer that after the break. <laughs> yeah, why don't I answer it after the break? Uh, I, before the break, what I can say is that when abductions were just coming into vogue uh, back in the uh, 80s, um, uh, I would have people come up to me after my uh, lectures and presentations, and, and they would tell me confidentially if they, they believe that they had been abducted. And I actually enlisted the uh, assistance of a... Uh, uh, clinical psychologist at uh, at a university institution uh, who we did some uh, work with, um, and I was asked to form a uh, an abductee support group. Um, so I did actually work with um, David. Oh, why can't I remember his name? The the, the fellow uh, who uh, had published the Bulletin of Anomalous Experience. Um, oh my gosh! Anyways, he. Not, yeah, he, not uh, he Jacobs. Was, oh my gosh, a, who was that? That's going to drive no, me nuts. No, no, right? Yeah, he, yeah. He uh, he was actually a, a psychiatrist um, who uh, uh, who was fascinated with the UFO phenomenon and and uh, published a lot of stuff. He actually was at the MIT uh, thing. Anyways, I worked with him. He told me how to set up a, an abductee group, and I I stuck with the group maybe for a few months, and then I, I just realized it was much better for me to step back from it. Um, but some of the uh, cases that came to light uh, and uh, had come to me during that time, uh, I'll relate one or two of them after the break. Okay, now was it David Gottlieb? David Gottlieb. Okay. There you are. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, it just came one, back one to me. <laughs> because I have... Yeah, brilliant yeah, guy. Yeah, and I have, uh, you know, again, looking, uh, going through the Andruffel archives, I have, you know, a series of correspondence between them, and then I also do have that in my, my archive. So I'm going to go tomorrow. You've inspired me. I'm going to go in and really dig into those and read them that's that's cool well yeah he actually posited a code of ethics for abductee researchers which of course was completely ignored (laughs) (laughs) yes yes i saw that in there and i was just like where so where did this yeah where did this go because as you know in the in the abduction field it's it's like the wild west and i think that's such a danger (laughs) you know because you've got people that have you know, I mean, whether, you know, they believe they have experienced something genuine. And I think there there are uh, there are a lot of rabbit holes, dangerous rabbit holes that people could go down in, with regard to that. And I think that people are not super ethical in the abduction world. There, the are, there are a few. Out, there are a few out there. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And I just I'm so this is such a great conversation. I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so tell before we go to break, just tell everyone uh, you can go to your blog spot, which is UFO R U M um, UFO. Yeah, you just tell us because I'm, you for God, wow, that was so difficult. Help me, Lord Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I blog at uforum.blogspot.com, um, and I also um, uh, post the uh, Canadian UFO Survey with the assistance assistance of. Uh, Jeff Dittman to survey.canadianuforeport.com. Um, and in fact, we have, uh, I think he's posted a link there uh, to all of the cases. So all 20,000, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, uh, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and um, haven't done a TikTok yet, but that's all the <laughs> Well, maybe I'm, this weekend. I'm working on my dubstep, okay? I'm working on <laughs> You definitely have to post that. That could be... Yeah. I, You know, I was, for a, a brief moment in time, I was working on a, a little German dance. I went over to, to Germany, and, and I, I wanted to do the shoe plotler. I have no idea why, because I saw a really bad uh, YouTube video, and so I practiced it and got over there. I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but I, I attempted to impress people with my shoe plotler, and I was informed that that was actually a, a dance that uh, virgins who live in their mom's basement... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't know why I needed to tell you that. It's just one of those things. Thank you for listening and letting me letting me share that really interesting experience. But on that note, it was it was, it, 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 and I have got video of it. Maybe someday that will make its way to the internet. Probably not. But anyway, thank you for being here. We are going to take a break, and I want to just get, tell everybody in chat. You guys ask great questions. I love all of the people that that listen to my show and have. A good sense of reality, and we're definitely moving through a lot of interesting information, disinformation, uh, you know, delusional thoughts from people. And so I love having 
the guests that I have on the show to help impart good knowledge and critical thinking. You can go to ufoclassified.com to support the show. And thank you all for all of you that do help keep me on the air. So thank you. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I'm your host, Erica Lukes. Happy to be here every Friday night with my people. This is so much fun for me. And as most of you who listen to my show and follow my work know, I am pretty relentless about getting information, collecting information, getting it out to the public, and also trying to shine a light on some of the deception that we see that has really tainted the, the subject and will eventually keep us going in circles, which is not where I want to be. I know you probably don't either. So thank you. And, and Bill, thanks that uh, on the comment about the music, it was a TNT. It's a song called Blue Steel. And I do. That was that was very nice. So um, anyway, I am back here with Chris Rutowski from Canada, who is, is it has so much respect from people in the community, people who have been researching this for a long time. He is has just gifted his archive to the University of Manitoba and is working very hard to make sure that this information is available to the public, which is so cool. He has written many books on the topic, and we're going to talk a little bit about those in a bit. He's also appeared on Unsolved Mysteries, UFO Hunters, The Paracast, uh, Discoveries, Close Encounters, and a and The Unexplained. And so he is also, which is super cool to me. Uh, he is president of both the Winnipeg Science Fiction Society and the Winnipeg Center of Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And that is, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, do you have like free time at all? Okay, cool. <laughs> but at least you're having fun though, right? Candle at both you ends, it will not last <laughs> tonight, but all my friends and all my foes, it gives a lovely light. <laughs> and I, that's, uh, I like that. And so I have to ask you, and then we'll get back into the, the question about abductions, but I mean, does, has your family been supportive of you over the years? I have to say they have. That's awesome. Um, they have been uh, very, very supportive. Uh, in fact, my wife... Uh, <laughs> has uh, attended with me uh, at a number of uh, UFO conferences and uh, uh, helped uh, uh, man book tables and uh, actually it, I think it, uh, it was a Paracon the last Paracon that Stanton Friedman did before he passed away um, she and I went down there and uh, he was giving his lecture uh, and uh, he wanted me to attend as well so she ended up selling his books as well <laughs> oh. and uh, and having having to field all sorts of questions and and things like that, so sure, her knowledge is uh, is very significant in this too, and uh, through osmosis, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, but generally the family's been very supportive. My uh, my daughter kind of rolls her eyes about you know yeah, there's another TV crew coming today, <laughs> yeah, that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, I can relate. I think my daughter is just like, do not talk to me about this, and the only time she'll even bring it up is if if somebody is you know, oh, I saw your mom on you know, ancient aliens or, you know, so it, it, it is funny to see their responses, but that's awesome that your wife has been such a supportive influence because you definitely, in a subject like this, you need to have people who, who support you because it's, you know, this can be different for a lot of people. <laughs> oh, it's, it's absolutely. And this is great because right now uh, I'm talking to you rather than doing the dishes and <laughs> say, you know, <laughs> what the priorities are, you know. Well, you get a pass tonight, so that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, I love it. So I so let's get back to the abduction thing because you mentioned, and I thought this was very interesting, that back in the eighties, that is when the abduction phenomena really became that in vogue. And I think that is interesting. So let's just continue with the abduction cases in Canada. Yeah, I mean, you know, we certainly had uh, cases before, you know, Betty and Barney Hill in the 60s, but it just seemed that the abduction phenomenon really started taking off in the, in the uh, 80s and into the 90s. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned before the break, uh, I had sort of 
been asked by some of the people who had come to me. They were looking for people like themselves, and they were, they thought that they were in isolation. And are there other people like them who have had experiences? Um, and at the time, the the feeling was, you know, let's get a, a support group going, um, and uh, but but treat it as an actual support group as you would for. Um, you know, uh, Overeaters Anonymous or AA, you know, and, and have all the basic rules in, you know, everything that's said in the group stays in the group and no crosstalk and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It had to be very much above board and, and very much because the idea was that we we're trying to help people, uh, whatever the situation is. So I did that for uh, a little while. I facilitated that and then stepped back because it really was evolving uh, in a lot of interesting ways, um, and um, for reasons I could get to after I talk about some of these cases, uh, I did step away uh, for some what I thought were pretty good reasons. Now, the one case that really comes to mind um, is that actually going back to Stan Friedman um, when he was up, uh, he used to stay at my place, by the way, when he was up in Canada, and back in 1988, uh, he had given a lecture, and uh, I was in the audience, and uh, people wanted to tell, tell him about their experiences that happened up here. And he said, well, you know, don't tell me, tell Chris Rakowski, and they had me stand up. And then um, after the lecture and everybody was filing out, this one guy was sort of um, holding, holding back and didn't want to come, and finally he was the last one to leave, and he came up to me and he said, I didn't want to say anything. Uh, you know, but I think I've had an experience. Can I talk to you sometime? So I said, yeah, sure. You know, you, you know, you're, here's my number. You know, we can figure something out. And uh, it was a while before he called me, but we eventually did set something up, and I did uh, meet with him. And he had a an interesting story. So the the most vivid of his memories came from uh, November of 87, and he was in his bedroom preparing to go to sleep, and he had sort of been reviewing the day's events, he'd been meditating, uh, he was in bed with the lights out, he was laying on his back starting to drift off to sleep, and after a short while he became aware of a presence of some sort, which seemed to be in the area of his closet or towards the closet door, and at the same time he felt a tingling sensation he felt he was paralyzed. He couldn't move uh, except moving his eyes. And he felt this presence getting closer to his bed. Now, he he couldn't remember seeing the entity completely. Um, he did have the uh, distinct recollection he could see a face. Um, and it had approached to not more than a, a foot in front of his eyes. And when I asked him to draw it, um, he it, it, he didn't draw the classic gray at all. It was sort of a sort of a, a round face thing uh, with uh, wrinkly skin, slit like eyes, thin mouth, and he had some sort of helmet on it. Um, and he remembers feeling that uh, whatever was was happening to him had something to do with this this entity, this creature. And he had something to do with his memories. And eventually, after a few minutes, it seemed to fade. And that was the experience. Now, it was bothering him because he felt that there was something he was missing. And so uh, I started working uh, with him a little bit. I was very curious about this. And I um, had known somebody who was a, uh, a clinical psychologist, not a hypnotist as such, but a clinical psychologist who actually um, worked with police on uh, hypnotic regression for criminal cases. And um, I, I mentioned this to him, and I said, would you be interested? And he said, well, of course, it's not, it's not that simple. You don't just hypnotize people. And, and uh, uh, the idea is that uh, if this is bothering him, and this, this fellow uh, who had come to me, he, he was actually uh, had a lot of anxiety, he was very, very nervous. Um, he felt that he was being watched and monitored by whatever had, had come to him. It, it was actually at the point where it was, it was actually um, causing him to be fearful to go outside. And because it was causing him distress, 
the psychologist said, well, yeah, it's worth a try, even just for the sake of relieving his stress. I mean, the idea that we're trying to help somebody come through these, this, uh, these feelings of anxiety. So, um, we set up and, um, uh, uh uh, the first first couple of sessions, of course, were not hypnosis. Uh, they they were um, just basically counseling, uh, getting to know some relaxation techniques and so forth. Um, and I was not part of all of these because you know um, this is patient uh, doctor confidentiality and and so forth. But um, this guy did agree that when the hypnosis session did actually occur, that I would I could be present. And it turned out that because this was a a clinical psychologist, um, there actually was a room with a two-way mirror that I could be on one side and uh, and watch and listen uh, during the, uh, the actual hypnosis session. So after some time, it was felt that it was time to give it a try. And the clinical hypnosis hypnotist um, started working with him, and I was in the other room um, and listening and watching. And um, the, the clinical psych, psychologist, um, managed to put him, uh, under and under hypnosis, <clears throat> this, uh, this fellow described his experience and some details did come out that hadn't been realized before. He now recalled seeing the entire body of this, this entity, not just the face, um, and uh, it was sort of like a like a uniform of some sort, um, two arms and two legs. And in its hand, one of its hands, uh, as it approached, was a rod with a light on the end. And as this creature was approaching uh, the the uh, the abductee in his in his bed, his anxiety increased and increased more and increased more and. Uh, the, this creature, you know, approached him, and this light on, on the end of the rod got closer and closer. And when it touched his forehead, he had such a violent and painful reaction. Um, he actually jumped uh, off the uh, the couch and had to be restrained and, and calmed down again. And then, in our sort of debrief after, this clinical psychologist said that he had n never had such a violent uh, reaction from somebody while under hypnosis and uh, whatever had happened to him was very, very traumatic indeed. Um, and of course, this fellow did have um, other experiences after that, um, but uh, this was, I think, uh, either not the last, but you know, almost the last time that we had worked with the clinical psychologist in this particular case. But he did continue to stay in touch with me, continued to have a number of memories and experience come to light, uh, some about him being taken uh, from his bedroom um, on board a craft through the solid walls of his uh, home uh, and so forth. Um, but he felt, he continually felt that he was under observation and these, this entity or entities were monitoring him, and they they you know uh, were really in control of his life, to the point of where he actually attempted suicide because um, he had no control of his life according to his uh, his viewpoint at that point, um, and had to be hospitalized. And that really made me uh, realize that the last person who should probably be involved with an abductee is a UFO investigator because, uh, I mean, we were working with a clinical psychologist who had lots of tools and experience in this regard. Uh, I actually majored in psychology in university and this was way beyond anything that I had, had ever uh, encountered. And I realized if people are experiencing trauma like this and uh, are attempting suicide um, that it should rightly be not in the realm of ufology whatsoever. I, I, I think that uh, I would rather see um, a professional uh, psychologist and psychiatrist work with people, not because they're, quote, crazy, but because some of the trauma and anxieties and emotions and feelings that are involved with these experiences 
experiences are so intense and so profound that uh, somebody who goes through a you know a two week field investigators course with a UFO group probably isn't qualified to to rightly help that person. And uh, from the physician standpoint, um, at first do no harm. And I think it's very important for individuals to get uh, professional help to help them overcome some of these anxieties and and feelings. Uh, uh, and uh, go through some therapy because uh, you know we're talking about the lives of people here, and this goes beyond just uh, uh, asking people what color the the flying saucer was. Thank you, thank Does you. That make sense? Thank Does you. That, that make sense? is so right on. I mean, that just yes, that is one of the best things I've I've heard in a long, long time, and I agree a hundred percent because you know you you see these people who are. You know, I mean, in, in, uh, they're vulnerable. And then, you know, like, and I, I, I talk about this on my show quite a bit because now that I'm thinking back on my experiences at some of these conferences where you see groups of people who have had, had experiences, some of them, or maybe, maybe not, you know, whatever the case it is, but they're in a, in a, a group of people who are being hypnotized by, you know, Lord knows who. And they're being, you know, told things that, oh, yes, this was actually, yes, this, you saw an alien being. And yes, this it was alien an being. Yes. Yeah, the, the, it was the Arcturian. It wasn't the Pleiadian. Because the Pleiadian would have done it differently. This was definitely an Arcturian. Right. And it, it, it's like you see, you know, I mean, it, it, this is so dangerous. I mean, this really is uh, cause for great concern. And people need to, you know, I know that we're all... You know, looking for community and we're looking for acceptance and things, but I just feel like the more I learn about the quote unquote, you know, UFO community, the more I would say just run because you, you know, you have an experience and that you, you hit it on the head. That's the last place you should turn for help. Right. And this wasn't the first uh, abductee uh, or contactee I worked with who had attempted suicide that uh, that I had, I had known uh, at least three others. And uh, uh, for me, you know, they're not getting the, the, the help they needed and uh, from a support group. So I, I, I think uh, uh, getting serious therapy and serious counseling, again, not because they're crazy mm -hmm. and not because they were not abducted by aliens necessarily, but because they're experiencing some traumas and whether they're from their childhood or, or whatever is happening to them these days, it's very important for them to to get some help, and I, I really feel for for individuals and would like them to get as much help as possible. Absolutely, thank you so much. That is really spot on, and thank thank you, thank you. Um, and and so I want to get to because Phil is is in chat, and he he wanted me to ask you a question about cases that occurred in Canada in the Ontario area with regard to sightings that occurred near. Uh, nuclear powered dams well I mean there are nuclear powered plants in Canada um, and uh, uh, there are some you know there there's a thousand cases in Canada every year and most of them occur near populated areas uh, statistically that's how it works and um, one of the the greatest population densities is in Toronto and just to the east of Toronto are some nuclear power plants. And the flight paths for um, airliners going east-west uh, go right over these power plants. So if there's a UFO that is seen uh, from the Toronto area um, in the direction of the power plants, are the UFOs associated with the power plants, or is it simply that there are you know, objects in the sky that appear to be flying over the power plants just because that's where they're flying. Um, now, having said that, um, there are some interesting cases involving uh, power plants or nuclear research facilities. Uh, I, I mentioned early in the show uh, about the Falcon Lake uh, case in 1967, which occurred not too far from the White Shell Nuclear Research Establishment, which was in operation at that time. Um, interestingly enough, uh, that is also the nuclear establishment where um, nuclear um, particles from the crashed Soviet Cosmos 954 were taken for analysis and storage 
uh, back in 19... Oh, I'm trying to remember. When did Cosmos crash now? Was that 81, 82, something like that? Um, maybe even earlier than that. Um, and uh, uh, this was a, a nuclear-powered uh, Soviet space uh, spacecraft, and its nuclear reactor um, crashed onto the Canadian tundra in northern Canada, um, and there was a joint effort by the United States and Canada uh, to retrieve these pieces from the frozen, uh, you know, areas from on top of the snow, on the frozen lakes, and uh, chunks as large as four or five feet long were were found. Um, and particles as small as the pinpoint of a pin uh, were also located and as much could be found as it uh, could be retrieved. Uh, and there were environmental studies, uh, you know, the habitat of, of uh, rare birds and so forth were uh, endangered and so forth. But these pieces were eventually taken to this nuclear research establishment, um, which was by coincidence, or maybe not coincidence, uh, close to where the Falcon Lake UFO case occurred in 1967. So there are some like that, um, and I know that there are uh, cases in the United States. Uh, Salas, for example, was talking very much about uh, UFOs at missile sites and, and so forth. Um, we don't really have those in Canada, but we do have UFOs that are seen um, over uh, military bases uh, and seen by military personnel as well. So not so much the, the nuclear power, uh, powered plants, um, because it's really tough to separate those from, uh, uh, you know, things that are, are seen just because of the population. But uh, there are cases on file. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I know Phil does too. And so I, I want to ask you because now I've got another uh, message from, from Barry Greenwood, who is listening. And he, his, he has always had a fascination with the 1913 fireball incident over Canada. What do you know about that, little Jim? Well, I have to dig into my astronomy uh, reading, but uh, that was a, pr a procession that uh, flew right over Canada and parts of the United States. Um, it was a, a magnificent uh, uh, bolide and, and uh, meteor fragmentation that was occurring. Um, there are, and, and you know, Barry, you probably have the information in front of you, but my recollection is that this meteor train stretched um, many hundreds of, of miles, if not thousands, uh, over a, a considerable period of time. And many people reported that it was as bright as day um, and uh, that it lit up the entire sky. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, that this meteor procession in the, mm -hmm. the early teens uh, in Canada was, was quite spectacular. Well, and I, I know that uh, Barry had sent a few years ago a picture, a painting that was, uh, you know, painted about this, and it was quite a spectacular painting, but it must have been just such a, a sight, and I will definitely have to, five, so Barry said it, it spanned 5,000 miles. 5,000 miles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, 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 very long. Um, and, of course, uh, Barry, if you can dig out, um, I'm trying to remember the date. I actually have it in one of my books, which is just out of reach in my bookcase. Um, but the first, well, maybe I have it. Where is it now? Uh, <laughs> I love this that you're like going over and pulling this I out. I, it's it, like... <laughs> I thought I had it right at my fingertips, but it's not. Okay. Um, it, one of the earliest uh, UFO reports uh, in Canada and all of North America. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was 1792, um, and uh, uh, there were some missionaries, uh, um, uh, Catholic mis Jesuit missionaries in what is now an area of Montreal, and there was an earthquake, and there were these fiery dragons, as was described, uh, shimmering throughout the entire sky. Uh, it was quite spectacular, and uh, it was recorded in the uh, in the diaries of uh, some of these uh, these Jesuit individuals um, back in the 1700s. I mean, it might even be 1600s. Barry might have it have the information handy, but you know, if you look historically, there's been some spectacular events uh, that were recorded. The ver the first 
one that um, that I have some decent documentation on was I think 1796, 1792, uh, in northern Manitoba, where um, an explorer by the name of David Thompson was with the guide, um, and uh, um, in uh, uh, a very isolated part of Canada is in the winter, and this object was seen to move through the sky. Um, and I think the phrase was that it was dashed, it dashed to the surface of the ice like a sound of, of uh, molten fat and uh, oh. just sort of splat. And uh, they went to look on the surface of the uh, ice and couldn't find anything. But uh, it really impressed this explorer who recorded it in his diary. Uh, so, I mean, it just, it, it, there's lots of testament that uh, the UFO phenomenon has been with us for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, people uh, go into the ancient astronauts thing and uh, uh, can find things going way, way, way back. But even in historical, relative historical times, when we can look back on diaries and, and records uh, that show that uh, relatively modern times, the, the objects seen in the sky uh, have been documented as well. Isn't I, I, and this is the the cool part about this? I mean, sometimes you get so at least I do get you know so involved with some of the uh, <laughs> some of the things that are going on in the world and of ufology and the people. It's like you just don't focus on some of these really extraordinary uh, cases or you know I mean just the, the history of of things like this. And I love that. That is amazing. And so I want to ask you now, because I've got another question in chat about men in black cases in Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there have been some. Um, uh, nothing to me. Um, there's a fellow named Ed Barker who, uh, who said that um, there was one that happened to him uh, here in Canada. Um, uh, and there have been from time to time um, people who have uh, uh, said that they've been visited by, you know, supposed military people, except they're all dressed in black with, with flat black hats and things like that. Um, I know that David Hazel, um, who had wrote an interesting book called The Missing Seven Hours about a, uh, uh, an interesting abduction case in Ontario, um, he himself has... Uh, had some run-ins with men in black um, and some he, some cases some instances where he had uh, had an interesting uh, file on a, a particular case put it in his uh, file drawer and uh, uh, left the, his apartment uh, when he came back uh, the apartment lights were on uh, but it was still locked and uh, he was gonna he was bringing somebody over to see the file opened his file drawer and of course the file wasn't there um and uh he was, was very very upset and, and uh uh concerned about what was going on and uh there was this suggestion that there was a person dressed in black hanging around uh, the area and keeping track of him parked outside his uh his home and that type of thing and then about uh i forget now whether it was a, a few years later or a few months later but uh he happened to be just going to the file again um, and opened the file drawer, and of course this file was exactly in the spot where it had disappeared from so many, many months or years before. And, uh, you know, this gave rise to him thinking that uh, perhaps he was being monitored or watched or the men in black themselves were uh, keeping track of him. And uh, so, yeah, we have had cases, um, and yes, we do know the mythology about uh, Ray Barker and... Uh, you know all that that good stuff and how it started out as a perhaps a, perhaps a plank a, a prank, but it's taken on a life of its own and uh, uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that uh, some clandestine organization uh, is keeping track of uh, ufologists for one reason or another and or or witnesses, but we simply don't have those proofs and probably never will. Well, it is interesting because I I have heard uh, from various uh, places that um, Robert Bigelow actually had somebody on um, his, his, that was employed for him, uh, Gary Hernandez, who was, who was paid to by his uh, account, apparently, to, to become a man in black, 
to come in and mm. kind of sweep up information and, you know, dress the part and, and, and things. And so that's interesting. I'll have to try to find, find out more information on that, but I've definitely heard that from different sources. And it's like, you could see how some of these, these things, ideas that have been seeded into the population, how they could be used as a, as a cover for other, other things. Yeah. Yeah. I strongly recommend people reading Gray Barker's book. <laughs> Yeah, I need to read that again. It's just been, it's been so long and there's so many books to read on the subject, but Gray Barker really was an interesting fellow. So I, yes. and now I want to go to, um, I, I want to ask you another question about uh, Wilbert Smith and the Wilbert mm -hmm. Smith memo from 1950. Right. Yeah, this is another one that, that again, really has taken on a life of its own. The short version of this is that Wilbert Smith was a uh, radio engineer with the uh, uh, Can Canadian uh, Telecommunications uh, Department at that time. And uh, he was interested in flying saucers. And, of course, uh, Canada had its own versions of Project Blue Book. Uh, there was one called um, Project Second Story uh, and Project Magnet. Now, Project Magnet is kind of weird because there actually were two Project Magnets, one that was interested in the possibility that UFOs flew on um, uh, following the magnetic lines of force in the Earth, um, and one actually just was mapping uh, geomagnetism magnetism, um, uh, all around the Earth, and the two sometimes get conflated. But Wilbert Smith was interested in, in this possibility, and the Canadian government, when it formed these uh, official flying saucer investigation groups, uh, had him participate, and uh, he was really, really keen, and he was uh, one of the few uh, uh, civilians who was allowed to be in the group. And the story is that when he went down to a, uh, a meeting in Washington, D.C., uh, and the, this particular meeting was the forerunner of uh, the FAA meetings that we have today that decide um, broadcast channels and broadcast wavelengths. You know, um, the one that that uh, decides whether uh, AMC is going to be 1173 on your on your channel cable or uh, you know 1174 that type of thing. Uh, and uh, back then, um, you know, he had gone down to represent his telecommunication, telecommunications department. And while down there, he had met with, and this is the way the story goes, um, some of his uh, counterparts and associates uh, who gave him information about flying saucers uh, to the effect that um, they were the most highly classified uh, topic in the United States government. Uh, they were classified uh, higher than the H-bomb, uh, that they definitely exist, and there's a, a group that's studying them led by uh, certain individuals. And um, he um, came back and issued this report, uh, which was um, available in the, uh, in the Canadian archives, uh, which is where other people have found it since then. And a lot of people say, well, this is proof that the United States had... Uh, uh, a UFO organization and the names of these people involved were uh, able to be tracked down. I know some people have tracked some of the uh, these officials down, and uh, um, some didn't get very far at all. And some said, "Yeah, we had it," and you know, it uh, uh, you know it, it was definitely a, 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 a something we were looking into, and we didn't come to any particular conclusions. And they were sort of being kind of evasive, but they did get some answers from a few of them. And this, you know, led fuel to the fire uh, that Wilbert Smith was really onto something, and he was—he has been raised to some sort of almost a godlike level, to according to some UFO fans and zealots, uh, that this guy really knew what he was talking about. He led a Wilbert Smith led a flying saucer club uh, in uh, in Ottawa until late '60s, I believe. Um, and uh, it was a forerunner of the contactee groups that we have today. Um, he believed later in life that he could uh, communicate telepathically with aliens and would sometimes sit out in his backyard in a lawn chair and do so. Um, 
And people are absolutely certain that he was a brilliant genius who uh, you know, knew everything there was about uh, aliens and, and flying saucers. Uh, Paul Kimball, who was actually Stanton Friedman's nephew, uh, filmmaker, uh, has been into UFOs for some time as well, publishes an interesting blog uh, called The Other Side of Truth, um, did his own investigations in Wilbert Smith and found that pretty well everything you knew about Wilbert Smith was wrong. Um, he was uh, very much down the ladder, uh, down the chain of command. Um, uh, when he was uh, asked about, uh, oh, uh, one, one other thing about Wilbert Smith, he had actually got permission from his department to set up a flying saucer detection station uh, just outside of Ottawa. And uh, apparently at one, one day, um, its, uh, its alarms went off and uh, uh, he went outside to look and it was overcast. So unfortunately, he didn't see anything. But uh, that proved that uh, a flying saucer uh, was actually nearby because the detection station uh, detected it. Um, but that um, the detection station was much less um, uh, efficient than uh, what most people believe, uh, that it would sometimes go off by itself uh, for no reason at all. The equipment was, was sort of slapped together. Uh, that um, uh, he uh, didn't uh, actually deny that anything was detected when he was uh, asked before a commission. Uh, it, it's just a very, very messy story and not as cut and dry as most people believe. Um, and the question that I have is, so if flying saucers were rated higher than the H-bomb, why would the, anyone in Washington tell that to a low-level civic or, or government employee from the Canadian government, a foreign national, uh, who was visiting there for a conference? That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, and there's been some suggestion that maybe he was played um, and given deliberate misinformation for whatever reason um, by the American government. So I don't know what to make of all this, but um, Paul Kimball has published a number of blog posts which show that Wilbert Smith really wasn't uh, as with it as uh, most people believe. Now, there's a lot of people who say that he was absolutely and and uh, uh, that uh, he, you know, knew what was really going on. He was in communication with the aliens themselves. And, you know, if you want to believe that, that's fine. But uh, it, the story itself is a lot muddier than, than that. And, and again, another brilliant point that you've made is it, why, why if this was going to, if this was really happening and this was more... Uh, explosive than the H bomb. I mean, why in the world would there be somebody like that disclosing that information? And I look, I compare that to the modern day, you know, uh, scenario where you've got, you know, uh, somebody like Jeremy Corbell, who is the new uh, voice of, of disclosure and, and things. And I think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, <laughs> but that's my own personal yeah, well, opinion. But, you know, yeah, even Paul Benowitz, the Benowitz story where, you know, he was deliberately played by Doty and a few others to, to uh, you know, to be driven basically crazy because of the, the misinformation they were feeding him. I mean, there's some strange stuff going on out there. There is, and let's talk a little bit more about that because I would love to get your your ideas uh, on the Benowitz case. I've had, you know, Greg Bishop on and... Um, uh, Christian Lambright and different people over the years to talk about that, but tell us what what you've learned and what your thoughts are on what happened with Benowitz. Well, you know, I I have to admit, you know, I don't know much about the case. I I uh, I've never investigated it myself. Uh, I've read about it. Uh, I've seen some versions of it that have been posted. You know, the version that I know is that here's somebody who was really into UFOs, and he had, as I mentioned, he was fed some. Some information about uh, uh, about uh, UFOs and aliens that uh, eventually, you know, caused this guy some some mental distress. So, I, you know, beyond that, 
I don't know. You probably know way more than, than I do about this. I'm just some Canadian guy, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're a Canadian guy that knows a lot. I mean, and that's what I love about you. And I love, I love following you and seeing what you have to say because you do know so much and you're so uh, grounded when it comes to putting forward information. In fact, I, I have to go back to the, the first conversation that we had, which was, oh my gosh, it must have been seven or eight years ago. And I was much more, um, I guess you would say, kind of a true believer at that time. And you were... You were, you know, you you tried to keep me grounded or pull me back down and give me good information. And I, I always, I look back at that and I just smile. Am I how times have changed? But thank you for, for doing <laughs> that for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ufology certainly evolves, doesn't it? Um, you know, you can, I know some people started out as true believers and then they became skeptics. And there's a few people who started out as some, as some doubting Thomases and they're, they've gone the other way. Uh and, uh, you know, I try to maintain contact with uh, people from a variety of viewpoints. Um, I mentioned about the, uh, 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 the satellite uh, uh, or the, the um, Starlink issue. You know, I've been in contact with some skeptics and debunkers. I mean, uh, at, at UFO conferences, I've sought out uh, Robert Schaefer and, and uh, hung out with him. Um, I, you know, get, uh, direct messages from James Oberg now and then from time to time. Um, and, uh, uh I'm on Tim Pretty's hit list, but that's another story. Oh. No, Phil Plate's hit list. <laughs> Phil Plate's hit list. Tim, Tim actually has, and I have actually gotten along pretty well and he, um, uh, he's, you know, been very kind to me in the Canadian UFO survey and found some, some errors that, I, that have been crept into some of the stats and stuff like that. So... Tim's actually been pretty good, uh, but Phil, Phil Plate has called me out a few times. And I don't um, know who Phil Plate is. I should know these things. Oh, oh, he's a he's a very very ardent debunker along the lines of uh, uh, Bill Nye, the Science Guy. Um, okay. uh, very very much of a popularist and a uh, uh, very interesting fellow. Very much of an interesting fellow. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I try, and I think people like Mick West, people are really down on Mick West, like poor Mick West. He's just trying his best to try and understand what's going on. And they're, they're calling him all sorts of names and stuff. And, and, you know, he does point out some interesting things. I mean, I, I actually, um, have, uh, I remember phone conversations with Phil class and, um, he and I, like, you know, I wouldn't say we got along, but um, you know, we did chat about a few things and, and a few cases, and um, I think people in ufology tend to dismiss skeptics and debunkers uh, a little too quickly because they're really good for finding uh, that the emperor has no clothes. I mean, the, they can find out some very interesting things and ask some very hard questions that uh, might be very uncomfortable for some people. So, uh, as much as some of them are, can be, uh, some describe a real pain in the ass, uh, they can find out some very good information. I mean, uh, Olberg, for example, is great at finding out rocket re-entries and helping us figure out stuff. Um, and uh, Printy is good at uh, uh, digging out, uh, you know, what old cases might have been and things like that. So I, I think, uh, you know, why it, it, it would be so much more sense to work with people of different viewpoints when trying to solve the UFO phenomenon. I mean, as, as good as 60 Minutes was for some people, um, where was even one skeptical voice? I would have loved to have seen anybody uh, appear on that, uh, that segment saying, well, you know, the cases are interesting, the videos are interesting, but, you know, we have some questions, and there are some valid questions that have to be made. Um, not necessary to give balance, and, uh, and you can't really do balance these days, but um, but at least uh, to offer some interesting uh, viewpoints that that aren't really uh, presented uh, in a lot of uh, situations. And I, I, you know, you talk about hanging out with Robert Schaefer. I mean, I, he's one of the people that I've gravitated towards at conferences. And I have, he actually, I'll have to send you the link to the, 
last, well, second to last show I believe I had with him on it where I, I at the very end, I asked him to sing one of his, you know, little operatic <laughs> pieces, <laughs> and he did. And it was just like, wow, this is so cool. Now I'm living. Robert Schaefer singing opera on my radio show. But, you know, I, I love, you know, having, I do, I, I appreciate that. And I guess back when I first got into this, I was just like, oh, you know, I mean, I didn't understand the value of somebody that was offering that information. And now that I'm, I'm learning that there are so many ways that we've been misinformed in the subject, I think that is, it is, as you point out, it is very critical to have that dialogue with people who are offering other ideas and possibilities. And for me to look at some of the social media uh, pages and things and see some of the admins basically just ripping people who are asking good and important questions apart is is really interesting to me because the you know et believers and and you know i mean all of these things should be enlightened beings so i would certainly think they wouldn't engage in that type of behavior but they do which is quite interesting yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely and and i i'll give you a, one of my pet peeves um debunkers and debunking um, one thing that happens um, when I'm making comments or, you know, people will post their UFO experiences to various UFO groups because you, you know, most people know that I'm uh, uh, an admin for uh, UFO updates. Um, but I'm also admin for a few other groups. And people will be posting their, their reports. And, um, you know, for the most part, uh, what people are, are posting, like, for example, they'll post descriptions of Starlink or they'll post their photos of uh, objects that are clearly reflections of, uh, of the sun on internal of the lens and, and things like that. And um, after a while, people start calling me or others debunkers. And the point is that there's a difference between simply investigating and coming up with explanations and debunking. And um, the feeling that you get from reading a lot of social media about ufology is that um, if you don't believe absolutely everything that's presented and don't go with the tide, uh, you're a debunker. And, you know, simply asking questions and offering some possible explanations is not debunking. It's actually doing your job as, a, as an investigator. If a MUFON field investigator uh, came back with you know, every single one of the cases that he or she was given as definitely unidentified, <coughs> excuse me, they're not doing their job. So you're actually required uh, as an investigator to try and come up with possible explanations, and rightly so, because, you know, 95-ish percent of all UFO reports have some explanations. So um, if suddenly there is absolutely no room for debate and, and uh uh, coming up with an explanation is is verbotum, verbotum, then there's something wrong there too. Absolutely, yeah, there is, and and I, you know, definitely encourage people to, uh, you know, I mean, you, you think that you are, you know, you've got this open mind, and yet you're the most closed-minded person on the planet, and we have to look at all sides, especially in a subject like this that is is literally fraught with so many landmines <laughs> and people trying to take advantage of people and and on hiding you know i mean using these big paywalls and i i know that they're again i wanted to say it has been interesting over the past few days to see or the you know since oh, the to to the stars academy just kind of the the resurgence of the mj12 stuff and i know that's going to be another Another thing that is it is coming into play, so we need we do need to ask critical questions, and we need to look at the research that has been done extensively on specific things like that before, so we're not repeating the same mistakes. Lord knows this would yeah, be a miracle. And I think, exactly, and that's one thing that that I'm finding is that a lot of people who are coming into the uh, to the UFO scene right now because of all of the uh, popularization of, of this right now don't realize that a lot of this has been examined and looked at years ago. Um, you know, whenever a case is revived and somebody says, oh, I know what that is, that's, you know, whatever explanation. And, and the reality is that's maybe something that was looked at and rejected because of more data 
uh, years and years ago. But if they don't know the background and they haven't done their research, and after all, you know, uh, Dr. Google only goes so far when it comes to research, um, uh, that, uh, you know, it, it's uh, you're doing yourself a disservice by not really going into uh, enough detail on what your passion is. I mean, if your passion is... Um, uh, cycling, um, then you know you're going to be wanting to know everything about bicycles. Um, you know what the difference between trepa- you know between the uh, panniers and the uh, uh, and the types of tires, and uh, you know the difference between titanium and aluminum and all that sort of stuff. If you're really passionate and you're going to be an Olympic cyclist, you want to know everything about cycling. And in ufology. Uh, you read a couple of websites and you think you know everything there is to know about about the topic. It doesn't work like that, and uh, you know it's just a matter of um, you know start asking some basic questions. Do use some critical thinking. You mentioned critical thinking right off the top, and uh, it's so important. You know I've I've taught some courses on uh, on uh, UFOs and uh, UFO investigations, and uh, I spend at least a quarter of the time talking about critical thinking and, and how to employ critical thinking in various situations. Oh, that would be so fascinating to, to be there and listen to what you have to say about that. But yeah, it, it is, it's very true. And I want to ask you, um, because there's been, there's always been this theme of religion, you know, the, the UFOs are demons or angels and Armageddon is coming and, and, you know, all, you know, this, the same types of things that we've seen for the past 50, 60 years and probably much longer than that. But what do you, do you feel that there are specific political or religious agendas that have been attached to the UFO community since the late forties? Well, that ties in very nicely with um, Reframing the Debate, which was uh, the book uh, that was published by uh, Robbie Graham uh, a few years ago. I have a chapter in it that infuriated some people because the title of that chapter was um, Our Alien Who Art in Heaven. Um, And in it, I described how uh, ufology has a lot of elements of religion. Uh, that uh, even just from the uh, the way that some contactees and abductees talk about uh, uh, changing their lives and um, uh, you know expanding consciousness and and uh, so forth, uh, but also in the sense that uh, adhering to particular elements of ufology religiously um, really does have a lot in common with a lot of New Age religions. Uh, there's a lot of blending of that. Um, that the aliens are looked upon as our saviors. Uh, they are completely omnipotent, of course. They can do anything. They're, uh, heck, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Navy has, has a new video where the UFOs fly in and out of water without any trouble at all. So the technology is so far advanced. They must be, you know, so um, far beyond our physical that uh, uh, they can do literally anything. They can communicate with us telepathically. They can impart knowledge to us. Uh, they can uh, uh, choose us to be their emissaries. Um, you know, there's so much in common with a with a real religion that it's hard to separate the two sometimes. And you throw that into the mix. I mean, w- the whole Navy, U- Pentagon and Navy UFO thing, um, that's been uh, discussed uh, in great great, uh, great detail without even mentioning any of this whole consciousness portal uh, modalities and all that sort of stuff, which is a big part of ufology right now. I mean, this is the real nuts and bolts stuff uh, that, uh, you know, we thought we had seen the last of for, for years. Um, but it's, uh, it's back again, and it's almost pushed away a lot of the, uh, uh, the more religious and, and spiritual aspects of ufology. And yet, it's there. It's definitely there. There's conferences... I think uh, Portal to Ascension is going on this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. And what is it, like 60 uh, people involved in ufology from from various aspects? Whitley Straber is there. I think Kathleen Martin is there. And it's all about consciousness and spirituality and and, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, contact, uh, you know, uh, direct contact with aliens through uh, 
uh, through mines and, and that type of thing. So that's existing at the same time that we've got this nuts and bolts uh, stuff happening with the Pentagon. And that's very interesting, too, that people are forgetting all about that. And I just wonder, because I've, I've spoken at some of these conferences, and I've been uh, quite alarmed at, at some of the uh, uh, Nazi uh, the glorification of Adolf Hitler <laughs> and things that I've seen at by at, with some of these very prominent speakers at some of these conferences, and it's like, wow. I guess I guess we can just let that slide, but that certainly uh, you know shows an enlightened being there. But crazy, crazy. Well, I mean, not only I mean, if you want to get into. Um, uh, aberrant behavior and, and ideas. I mean, a, a lot of people in ufology are are anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers. I mean, and I, I know you don't want to get into that, but uh, I might. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, yeah, you know, Nazis. There's uh, people who are, have been de- described as racist and and so forth. I mean, uh, it's an interesting slice of of our of our uh, culture. There's no question. Absolutely, it it really is, and it I. I will have to. I need to get you back on the show because my mind is now. I'm just thinking of all of these questions, but I want to ask you about your recent book, uh, "When They Appeared," from August Night mm. Press. Right. Um, yeah, this is the most recent um, that's out. All about one particular case happened in 1967. Uh, a, a fellow who's a bit of a rock hound was uh, uh, was walking through. Uh, uh, a very heavily forested, rugged area, uh, and um, the best description that we have is that uh, a Hollywood-style flying saucer landed on a on a flat rock outcropping that was not too far from him. Um, uh, it, it was about thirty-five feet across, twelve feet high, domed, um, lights uh, coming out of the uh, the top of it. Uh, a door appeared to open in the side of it. Uh, he thought that he could hear some voices coming from inside, thought that this perhaps was some sort of American vertical takeoff and landing craft. Maybe this was just the, at the beginning of Apollo, so maybe they were testing the Apollo uh, landing system. Um, walked up to it, uh, touched the side of this thing um, with his rubberized gloved hand. His rubberized glove melted uh, because it was so hot. The whole thing suddenly took off with a blast of hot gas that set his clothes and the leaves and pine needles on fire. He was uh, eventually treated um, at the emergency room of a hospital um, for uh, second-degree burns uh, and also some interesting uh, uh, checkerboard pattern of burns on his uh, lower abdomen. Uh, This was investigated by the Canadian Air Force the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and even the United States Air Force came up, condom uh, committee uh, members looked up at, uh, came up to this. Um, there was radiation found at the site. Um, in fact, the radiation levels were so high that the Canadian government considered closing off the area, which was a resort area, um, during the height of the tourist season. And then later, um, some additional radioactive materials were found at the site, chunks of pure silver that were also radioactive. Um, The case was investigated in great detail. Um, We have hundreds of pages of investigation files from the RCMP and the Royal Canadian Air Force. And it was in the conclusion of the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police that they had no explanation for what happened. Um, it uh, is easily one of the most interesting cases in terms of evidence because we have radiation found at the site. We have uh, pieces that were examined and taken to a number of labs for analysis. The uh, fellow himself was injured. We have the medical records. He went to the Mayo Clinic for a complete psychiatric examination as well as a physiological examination. And the psychiatrist at the Mayo Clinic said this guy doesn't make up stories. Um, we, the site itself is accessible. Um, and uh, it was investigated more than, than any other case that I can imagine uh, uh, in Canada, plus the fact that we have all this documentation. I can't think of another case that has three or four hundred pages of official documentation from from uh, 
military and police, uh, and we have access to it all. Um, so this book is not just about the case itself, what happened to him. We certainly uh, do have uh, a lot involved in that. But it's also about what happened to his family. Uh, his son was actually a co-author with me on this, and he talked about how it disrupted the family. He was bullied at school. You know, your dad saw a little green man, yeah, yeah, all this sort of stuff. And he was tormented. Um, the, the title of the book is When They Appeared. It has nothing to do with aliens. It has to do with when, you know, the living room uh, of the small home in a, uh, in a small uh, part of the city was invaded by military officials who were taking samples and uh, interrogating witnesses and, and neighbors and uh, um, children. And um, it, was, it was really quite phenomenal. So this is the social and psych psychological effects of a UFO case, plus the documentation. And uh, we also provide uh, and publish some of the documents that are found in the official files too. So it's a really fascinating uh, <laughs> account of what happened. You know what? And you, I mean, you say that, and it just I, my mind goes back to a, a, a case of that I have been trying to put together over the years here in Utah, where a woman was out rock hounding, and she uh, was she separated from her family, and then when they found her a few hours later, they found a grid-like pattern of radiation burns on her torso, and that the uh, physician that she examined her did say that they were radiation burns and interestingly enough her medical files um disappeared but it was it's just one of those those things that's incredible that you have done such mm -hmm. fantastic work uh you know with, with and we have son. the medical file for this oh my we have the medical gosh. file for this yeah okay i'm going to be ordering your book tonight <laughs> 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 that is so cool and i i knew that this was going to be a, a great conversation but i had no idea it was going to be this good this thank you what a fun night and, and i definitely hope and i just of course all the you know it, it at the very end of the show chris just i lost my my connection with him on skype but i'm glad that we had Two or three minutes left to go. So this is the way it rolls in the land of the Lukes. But I want to thank Chris Rutowski for being here tonight. This has been an incredible conversation. And I think there are lots of threads that we can work from here with all of this. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to UFO Classified, for supporting the show, for having my back. Um, this has not been an easy journey for me. But I love it uh, nonetheless. And I think that when I talk to, well, I know that when I talk to different people from all over the world and I hear their stories, and not only with encounters, but also, you know, dealing with some of the blowback from the things. And Chris talked about that in the last uh, moment, last few moments of the show. I think those are such uh, significant things for all of this. And so I hope we learn from all of this. And I look forward to being here next week and the week after. I've got a couple good guests coming up. So you definitely will want to be here next Friday. And I know that Mark O'Connell hopefully will be on very soon. Um, so we will get that going on too. But you guys stay safe. It is a very sad night and moment in this evening when I have to say goodbye to all of my friends. But it, that the time has come. So you guys stay out of trouble. You know I won't be. You know, I kind of troubles kind of something that I might enjoy getting into. But anyway, thank you all. Stay safe. Thanks, Chris. And you guys have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye. I'm I'm here. So my skeptical mind, and that's just that's just who I am. I no, I, I'm, I'm here. To, well, yeah, of course you've got this guy over here that's logical and reasonable, and you got this guy over here that's wearing a tinfoil hat. Of course the tinfoil hat so that guy's gonna see a lot of stuff, right? He's, he's like imagining it, or he's watched one too many uh, sci-fi movies. One of the used to help us frame hypotheses for UFO uh, propulsion, power, stealth, uh, weaponry. Everything that we experience is very positive. Sometimes the field of ufology has a short memory span.
we didn't know we didn't know anything about the 22 million dollars back then we just kind of thought well this is you know and i think that was the reason why they were looking for military type people because in the military you work with whatever you got no matter what the situation is you just kind of adapt and overcome what are you gonna do with all this you can't even take care of your own files and get them put into the current system, but yet you want to go collect other people's things. Uh, so what are you going to do with this? Who are you giving all this to? It just really struck me about how the common thread seemed to be deception, but deception of the human nature. So that's what I started thinking, hmm, who would these folks be? I mean, then I started thinking about the intelligence agencies, what role would they play? And what would be what would be their motivations for getting involved in ufology? Me, I'm not saying that because the gimbal is not a rotating flying saucer, that, that means that all the UFOs are false. Not not at all. All I'm doing is I'm looking at this one case, these individual cases, and seeing if there's an explanation for those. So try to, if if I could ask people out there listening. Don't think that I'm trying to attack your entire uh, beliefs about these things.